Uh, welcome back to everyone. I'm so glad to be able to welcome you to the second day of our uh, conference on emerging research on beginning farmers and ranchers. And we're going to start off this morning uh, with a, a session on transitions. And this is going to talk about transitions across um, farm families. And um, we have a number of, of independent uh, research uh, uh, efforts that people are going to talk about today. And I'd like to uh, just let you know that after this is over, this is going to be a two hour session. We're going to take a break for one hour. And uh, during that time, the lounge will be open and we encourage people to continue to, to use that um, uh, in order to, to network with people. And then we're going to have a session on farm credit, uh, ground truthing the beginning farmer experience with credit. And we're going to have uh, some uh, lenders who are going to share their perspectives. And then we're going to close the conference at uh, 145 Central, 245 Eastern time. And uh, I'll be back uh, periodically throughout uh, that time. But uh, looking forward to hear our speakers this morning. And I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, David Baker, who's the director of the Iowa State University Beginning Farmer Center. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Jeff. Yeah, so a little bit of feedback, but we'll try and work through those issues. I suppose there was two speakers on. Um, yes, welcome back to the day two of our conference. I hope uh, many of you were able to glean lots of great information and ideas from yesterday's speakers and presenters. Um, today, this morning, for the next couple hours, we'll have five different topics with nine different presenters. And so it'll be about a two hour uh, with 15 minutes for each uh, presentation. Um, I'm hoping that we can either have some of the questions maybe during the or right after the speaker or presenter or hold them to the end and, and we'll rate them as far as uh, votes and then we can ask them with the highest votes first. So our first presenter is Holly Rippon Butler from the National Young Farmers Coalition and her uh, paper is on land policy towards a more equitable farming future. So I'll turn it over to Holly. Okay, thanks. Thanks all and uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So the transition theme that I'm going to be talking about is really around the transition of land on a broad, broad scale in this country and what that means and what, uh, how policy relates to that. So I wanted to just first introduce myself briefly. I'm Holly Rippon Butler, the Land Access Program Director with the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I'm calling in from Saratoga, New York on Mohawk, Mohican and Abenaki land. Um, I grew up on my family's multi-generational dairy farm and um, I've been working with the coalition for six years on land issues. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I want to open by saying a little bit grounding, you know, this presentation, I'll be talking about land and want to acknowledge that when we talk about land and particularly land ownership, we're, we're fundamentally talking about a construct um, that land is an entity that can be bought and sold. And it's a, it's a colonial settler colonial framework um, that has been used to cause a lot of harm and land dispossession from indigenous people throughout history um, and a lot of really painful land loss. Uh, and, you know, just between 1776 and 1887, the US seized over uh, 1.5 billion acres from indigenous people. And this was done through broken treaties, policy, Supreme Court cases, state sanctioned violence. So this land loss, um, you know, is, is really significant and it was done through this framework that all of what we talk about when we talk about policy and land access um, is in that framework. And so I just wanna acknowledge that and acknowledge that by talking about this framework, um, we hope we can move away from extractive relationship with land into a, a more positive direction in the future. Um, we could talk about, uh, let's see, we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, so I, I'm with the National Young Farmers Coalition, which was 
founded in 2010, we're a national grassroots network of farmers, ranchers, and supporters fighting for a um, more bright and just future for agriculture in the United States. And we have a number of farmer chapters that have launched all over the country, um, 46 chapters. And um, we work, we do our work through this chapter organizing, building coalitions, addressing structural barriers through policy, and also providing business services to, to farmers to help them navigate uh, growing their farm businesses. And in terms of our, our land access work, um, you know, we are, we're imagining a future where land access is no longer a barrier that prevents young people from building vibrant and resilient agricultural systems um, oriented towards communal well-being. We are working to ensure that power and wealth is returned to Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, that um, high quality farmland with appropriate resources is available, accessible, and affordable uh, to all working farmers in the US, and that aspiring growers have the security they need to realize their farming dreams. Um, so we're doing this work through, um, through policy reform, uh, building a network of engaged service providers around land, and uh, specifically offering resources. Um, we can go to the next slide. So just a little bit about this project and perhaps one way in which I think my presentation is a little different some, from some of the others that, that you'll hear as part of the conference is that I'm um, coming at this from a real advocacy point of view. The project that we have done is much more a project than an academic paper. Um, there is a, a research report as part of as part of the project that we um, we worked on over over the course of a year um, with support from Cliff Barr. Um, but also it's it's kind of much broader than that. It's meant to bring in perspectives from multiple stakeholders who we interviewed, um, multiple policy platforms that we reviewed from other organizations. And we've compiled this and we're creating a website that we will launch very soon um, that will include this information as well as featuring stories directly from a number of young farmers who are working through the land access challenge. Um, so, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Um, like I said, we'll have this website coming soon. Um, you'll be able to do the report. We'll have continued narrative building around this issue, um, farmer stories, and a policy advocacy library where you can explore policy recommendations and uh, associated resources. Um, we, you know, we don't want this to be a static report as an advocacy organization. We're always thinking about the next opportunity to make policy change and how we can build a resource that helps um, launch that conversation. So, you know, if I, I have a lot of stats and data in the, data in the slides and um, I'm gonna go through it all really quickly because this is just a really quick overview, but I thought I would just outline kind of the key points from the report. So. Um, if you, you know, take nothing else away from all, all of the data that I'm about to say, um, kind of what the key narrative of this project and the report is, is that there is a lot of farmland in the United States and what we do with it is incredibly important for our climate action, for our economic prosperity, for racial justice, for public health, uh, just to, to name a few things that are all tied back to the land. And um, we're in the midst of a major transition of that land as producers are aging out. Um, and, and this is both an opportunity and also a challenge. So a lot of um, young farmers are really struggling to access land because it's been valued as a commodity. We valued it for the ability to extract wealth. And it, that's, that's showing up in the inability to afford land if you're a food producer. Um, and there's a lot of uh, deep inequity in how land is owned and distributed and used and that really that all ties back to public policy and how policy has been uh, a driving underlying force and um, you know we need to think about policy as part of the solution for all of these like large intractable problems uh, that are related to land and land access. So you know just a few um, quick statistics I, I don't 
I don't want to go through all these in detail because I want to get to sort of some of the other points of the presentation before I run out of time. But um, this, you know, just to make the point, there's a lot of land in the United States that's in agriculture, about half of the land base of the country. Um, a very small percent, only about eight and a half per percent is devoted to food we eat. Um, most of this farmland is owned privately, the rest owned by the US government. And um, a, a lot of it is leased, about 40% of farmland is leased and almost half of the landlords have never farmed. So I think we're seeing kind of increasing trends of non-farmer ownership and consolidation as well. Uh, very less than 8% of farms operate um, more than a third of all farmland. Um, you can go to the next one. So uh, I think also some really important statistics to point out is that the ownership of this land is really, really deeply unequal. 98% um, of all farmland is owned by white landowners, and that has uh, cascading effects into who is um, a farm business owner and, um, and who has the opportunity to you know, make an income and um, have a business in farming. And I think, you know, thinking about land as uh, this canvas where the results of a racialized system of policy are, um, are really visible. And that um, this, you know, is, these statistics are uh, true against a backdrop of the fact that most farm workers are, are farmers of color and those um, who are doing a lot of the labor on farms. So, um, you know, this, is um, a critical moment to address this. This is slide, I just wanna make the point here that we're, we're losing a lot of farmland. Um, there's a lot of great work by American Farmland Trust and their Farms Under Threat Report to really dive into that side of the issue. Um, we are, uh, you know, fundamentally not, not valuing land for its use for agriculture. And that is, that is really fundamental to the challenge that young farmers face. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and that, uh, you know, part of why land is so important, why we talk about it so much is that it is really connected to the transfer of wealth. 80% um, of wealth is inherited. And there's been a lot of wealth uh, that has been changing hands and accumulating through, through land. Um, we, you know, I talk about this moment being really important in this moment of transition. There's a lot of land that's predicted to change hands simply because of demographic age of landowners is and farmers increasing, but um, a very small percentage of the land is expected to be made available to non-relatives. So it becomes really important that we focus and talk about um, what is gonna happen when this land changes hands and what will happen in particular if we do nothing to really use public policy to create the outcome that we want to see. Um, and, you know, again, this land is really important. It really matters for farmers. It's um, security, it's capital, ability to have collateral. Um, and it, it has a cumulative effect on farm viability. So if you have land, you have the ability to um, borrow against that land and buy more and or grow your business. And it also is um, very critical for soil improvements, having the long-term security uh, through owning land and um, the ability to take action towards climate resiliency. Also, I wanna you know, mention that we hear from farmers, it's a huge factor on mental health, just having the land security, that ability to have the stamina, both physical and mental to stay in farming over time. Um, and you know, there's just a lot of interconnected challenges related to accessing land. I apologize that this slide is a little blurry, um, but read the report, it's all in there. <laughs> and, um, and that you know, the way that these challenges intersect can really um, exacerbate the, the, the challenge. When we talk about, you know, we say land access is the number one challenge. I think it's worth breaking it down a little bit. And that's what we, you know, I wanted to do is just say, it's not just about access to land. It's does that land have water? Does it have infrastructure? Is it close to markets? Can you do what you need to do based on the zoning restrictions? Um, are you going to be able to negotiate the farm transition? And then on top of that, how does your cost of accessing land um, 
play with your cost of health insurance, labor, childcare, things like that. And um, do you have housing? So um, I wanted to point that out. And just to tie it back and um, kind of wrapping up, I wanted to really, you know, bring home the point about the connection between land policy and power and that this picture of land ownership that I've been talking about, is not an accident and really um, public policy is a critically important tool for change. Um, you know, I wanna also acknowledge that for, for people of color who are deeply familiar with this history and how policy has been used towards land dispossession, this kind of litany of examples can, can be really harmful and, and triggering. And that um, I, you know, I bring this up to, uh, to talk about the framework in which these policies have taken place and to acknowledge that policy can be both liberating and oppressive. And we need to think about how it's been used as a tool and to think about how um, we can change it going forward uh, and build power in a way that it brings us towards a more equitable distribution of land and resources. Um, I think, you know, uh, we're just going back for a minute, if I could spend one more minute on the slide, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, the way that policy has been used, there is this like long list of examples of specific policies, but I really wanna highlight um, that power comes from understanding the framework of policy as a tool for change and that, you know, it's been used to control access to power through land. Um, it's been used to remove people from land, to, to give land to, to white people, to um, protect the gains made by, by those people. Um, it's land policy has been used to tightly link land and voting, which kind of has a uh, repeating factor on putting those in power who have control over the land um, and keeping them there. And um, these are all you know, strategies I think that we need to call out and be, be aware of and talk about explicitly um, as we're moving forward. And that I want to, you know, call out without. It's important to also talk about the the history of resistance and innovation in the face of this kind of policy legacy that has come from communities of color, and that you know many of the practices that we talk about as being sustainable, regenerative, organic. Um, these have all come from from Black, Indigenous, other people of color communities, and tools such as land trusts and community supported agriculture. Um, and cr critical policy advocacy uh, in advancing civil rights have all been um, created in, in the face of land-based uh, injustice. So, um, okay, the last last slide, I just wanted to say, you know, the report um, talks about the history and the challenges that farmers are facing, you know, the importance of this moment, uh, but we also provide some, some framework and, and guidelines for how policymakers can can think about creating policies that are um, centered in uh, land justice and centered in um, policy in, in meeting the needs of farmers. Um, so let's see. You can go to this, the next one. Um, we we list those guiding principles. We also have a number of state, federal, and local policy recommendations that come from Young Farmers Coalition as well as other organizations. And these are all kind of within the framework of our four main calls to action that we eliminate inequities in land ownership and access, protect farmland for producers, facilitate appropriate, affordable and secure land tenure and support farm viability and transition. Um, all, you know, we must see land as a vital resource on which our collective future rests and rather than a commodity fueling our economic growth. Um, and, you know, I definitely want to call out that there are so many great organizations who are really doing this advocacy work as well as the key on the ground work to create this equitable transition around land. Um, Agrarian Trust is one that's doing a lot of practical on the ground work. Um, Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, Minnow is a new group in California, um, Soul Fire Farm, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, um, NDN Collective, they're all doing really important um, indigenous food and ag initiative and doing important policy and on the ground work. So um, that's all, Those, that's my contact information. Um, that's our current, current page where you can go to check out a little bit more about our land campaign work and we'll be launching 
the report and all this soon, soon. Um, but yeah, please reach out as, if you're interested in talking more about this or being part of our land advocacy work. Thank you so much, Holly. Uh, very thought provoking and very interesting. Um, if you want to see my video. <laughs> so yes, we're right on time. And our next uh, presenter will be uh, Julia Valiant from Indiana University. Her topic will be on how likely are landowners to transfer out of the family, a Midwestern analysis of that uh, correlates with lessons for mobilizing beginning and socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, uh, their land access uh, with policy incentives. Hi everyone. I'm Julia Valiant representing our Sustainable Food Systems Research Group at Indiana University. And yeah, Holly, I just wanna thank you for, for getting us all going in this session, all grounded to the earth and to our history and to one another. Um, what I'll be presenting on is entirely within the context, within the paradigm that we're in right now of owning the earth and US property rights and land rights as they are now. But I will speak to some of what you presented in your, in your opening piece. Um, so what we're gonna do together is look at um, beginning farmer and rancher land access from the perspective of owners who currently own the land. And so we'll start with some background on landowners role in land access. Um, then we'll look at a certain type of policy response that some states and the federal government have created to incentivize landowners to lease land or sell land to a beginning producer instead of an established producer. And so then what we'll do is since nearly all of these rental and purchase agreements that are part of these incentive policies are between unrelated pairs of landowners and beginning producers, we will take a quick look at land access agreements between non-relatives. Then we'll look at findings from some primary research our group did with the Kansas Rural Center by surveying Midwestern and Central Plains landowners. And we'll finish by reflecting on three takeaways from the findings. Um, this work was part of an NCR SARE research and education project that we led. Next, please. Um, Okay, so let's begin by looking at this quote at the top. It is from, one moment, please. I need you to go last down. I need you to go last down. Um, okay, so the quote at the top. Um, it's from this great national group um, that did excellent work on farm transfer and land wow. access a decade ago wow. out of Vermont, pardon. I need you to go talk to Dana. No, this is something cool. <laughs> I can't talk to you even though it's about school. Can I do that with society? Pardon me one second. Oh, the joys of working from home. Okay, I'm back on stage. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, so this um, great group out of Vermont, um, I love this line that they put into their work saying, um, successful farm entry and access to farms are often one side of a coin. On the other side is successful farm exit and farm transfer. Um, so now looking at the beginning farmer and rancher side of the coin, um, we know from listening to Holly just now and listening to Nigel yesterday that opportunities for beginners to establish and expand their operations are super difficult to access whether they want to rent or crop share or herd share or buy some uh, or buy a farm. Um, and that's true for first generation producers as well as multi-generational producers who grew up on a ranch or a farm. Um, and where it leads is that the people who have an advantage in securing opportunities are people who are already established as operators and owners. Next slide, please. Then flipping the coin over, um, 
we look at the landowner perspective. And also for them, transferring an operation and especially ownership of that operation is not easy. There are big financial disincentives um, that trace to policy. Um, and I'm even in the midst of a farm of, of my family's farm transfer right now. And on looking at it on paper, you would think it would not be difficult, but it actually is super difficult um, among my brothers and my folks and me. And that's partially because it's about mortality and it's just emotionally and culturally difficult. Here's a couple quotes from Mary Swander, who's this great writer in Iowa, who's done excellent work around farm succession and transfer. And the first one, she says, look, good Midwesterners don't talk about anything that has money and death attached to it. And then in the second one, she's quoting a farmer who said to her, um, Mary, it is a lot easier to talk about sex with your offspring than it is farmland transfer. And so as a result, land is bound up and it typically transfers after a delay of many years. And when it does transfer, it usually goes to an established operator, heirs, or to an established owner. So within agriculture, it's a growing priority to assist land owners and land seekers with the processes of succession and transfer and land access, both to help people to be able to enter agriculture at all and ideally with secure land, land tenure and to help owners achieve financially secure and meaningful to them transfers. So next slide. Here are some stories of the many that we are grateful to be collecting through our research um, of a landowner who's choosing to lease land or sell land or make some other type of land access agreement with a beginner. Um, so in the first one I, I, I'm sharing with you um, is from here in Indiana um, and it's from a grain farmer who chose an unrelated farm seeker, sold equipment to him slowly over time, hired him to custom farm their grain, and now that seeker runs the business, has equity in the equipment, and is preparing to buy land. The second story is of a flower farmer in Illinois. She has secure rental of an unrelated owner's house, land, and beautiful buildings um, where she's building her direct marketing and her agritourism business. And this picture is from the flower farmer's Instagram. And then the, the third story from here in Indiana is of three acres that weren't even agricultural acres. They were just a big yard um, belonging to an unrelated owner. Those three acres are now the farm of a direct marketing vegetable farmer. The owner and the farmer have a five-year lease plus a covenant in the owner's will and on the deed protects the farmer's long-term access. And they have built, um, a windbreak and high tunnels and a commercial kitchen on this piece of land. Um, so I know that um, in this session, the chat box is, is for questions, it's the Q&A box, but I wanted to invite you anyway, that if you have a land access story um, that you appreciate, that you, you yourself have done or that you've heard from others, um, please go ahead and drop it into the Q&A box because it would be really great to get to read those. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so to assist landowners in managing to make a land access agreement with their beginner, a growing number of states and the federal government have created policies that cater to the landowner or landlord end of the land access equation. So what these um, incentive policies do is they reward a landowner with money who leases or sells to a um, qualifying entering producer. Um, what that landowner earns is a state tax credit of a percentage of the income that they earn through that lease or sales agreement with the beginning farmer. Or if the ground has been in CRP, and is coming out of CRP um, through the federal program, that person earns two more years of CRP payments. Next, please. So just to highlight and go into some definitions of what, uh, who qualifies as an entering producer for these 
policies. Next. Um, depending on the policy, um, an insuring producer is defined in one of these ways or more of these ways. So a beginner based on their number of years of experience, they need to have less than a maximum value of net worth. Some policies specify veteran farmers or women farmers or farmers of color. Um, and others use age or first time landowner status. Um, women farmers and farmers of color are both together under this USDA category of socially disadvantaged producers that we heard Scott speak about yesterday. Um, and these are people from groups that face racism or sexism or both um, based upon the groups that they're part of. Um, and to situate this a bit, um, we know that the 20th century was a time of major exodus of people from agriculture in our country, um, such that from 1920 to 1997, 98% of farmers, um, or sorry, of African-American farmers exited agriculture um, compared to 66% of European American farmers, um, such that now, even though people of color make up a quarter of the US population and 62% of farm laborers, um, but they only make up 3% of agricultural landowners, Women make up half the population, but only 24% of agricultural landowners. And if you're interested in learning more about this, here's a couple of really great pieces. Next, please. Okay, so just returning to the policies. And so that's who the qualifying entering producers are for them. Next, please. Yeah, so the, these categories of policies, um, the Aggie Bond has been around a long time and is a great forerunner and inspiration. Um, the federal uh, version is the Transition, Transition Incentives Program of the Conservation Reserve Program. And then the state versions are beginning farmer tax credit programs um, of which Nebraska was the first to create it, create its own. Um, Iowa has had one for a dozen years. Minnesota has had one for a handful of years. They're brand new in Kentucky and Pennsylvania, and they're before the legislatures in Ohio and Oregon. Colorado and Montana also have beginning farmer tax deductions on the books. Next, please. Participation in these incentives is really good, and at the same time, it can be better. Um, we have about 6,000 landowners participating nationwide. Iowa accounts for half of that, followed by Minnesota and some other big Western and Midwestern states. The numbers are really good and yet the targets are even higher. Next, please. Um, in order to recruit more landowners or some other uh, evidence that there's space for more, many more landowners to participate in these incentives, um, the federal program hasn't been used at all by half of states and very little by most states. With, even within the states that are big users of this federal incentive, the numbers really concentrate by county, um, such that the last farm bill earmarked $5, or $5 million to improve mobilization and outreach to beginning farmers, veterans, farmers of color and women. Um, the state programs, it's normal for them to use less than the full amount of money that they're allocated every year. Their budgets for publicity and administration are really low. Next slide, please. Um, so they need to um, conduct very efficient outreach and economize on their outreach. Um, Agreements between non-relatives are particularly germane to these incentives. They're either required that landowners and land seekers who make a lease or sales agreement for the incentive be unrelated to one another, or even if they're not required, that's still the most common arrangement that the programs tend to see. Next, please. And what we're looking at these in these pie charts is the blue. Um, and on the left, it's showing all agricultural land in the country and how people acquired ownership of that land. The blue piece is a purchase from a non-relative um, following an or followed an order of size by um, the red, which is being inherited 
land that's been inherited or gifted. And the green is land that was purchased from a relative. And then the purple is the small slice showing purchased at auction. And then on the right, it's showing all um, agricultural land that's rented out, which in the Midwest is almost half of our land. Um, two thirds of agreements on that land are between unrelated tenants and landlords. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're getting into our um, survey of landowners, because what we were interested in doing is looking at how landowners who expect to transfer out of family compare to those who expect to transfer within family to see if there could be any clues to guide future research. Um, next slide. Um, so here is a list of service providers around the Midwest who sent out the survey to their networks, either through email or social media or both. Um, we were studying these service providers because we were doing some research on FarmLink and LandLink programs. Um, and so this was not, this did not go out to a representative um, sample of Midwestern landowners, rather it was a convenient sample. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. We heard back from 338 landowners, half of whom expect to transfer within their family, half transfer out of family. Um, it was mainly people who operate their land now or did in the past. Only 16% had never operated their land. The respondents were very highly educated. Three quarters had a bachelor's degree or higher, and it was half women and half men. Next slide. Here's where they lived. Um, the red and orange shows people who are likely to transfer out of family. The blue and green shows people who are likely to transfer within family and the yellow is neutral. Next slide. And then when we compared the two groups of landowners, those who expect to transfer out of family to those who expect to transfer within family, and when we compared them on single characteristics at a time, um, we found no differences in where they live geographically on a rural to urban spectrum, whether they ever operated their land. And in terms of their income, uh, both of the groups are likely to earn most of their income off farm and they share the same median off farm household income category. Next slide, please. They were different um, in that those who might transfer out of family are older. They're more likely to be active farmers now, and they're more likely to earn most of their income from agricultural production and less, they earn less off farm income. Next slide. When we subjected these characteristics to multiple regression, what I wanna show you a couple of highlights. Um, on the first two rows, we saw the biggest difference, which is that those who expect to transfer out of family need money from the sale of their land to finance retirement. Whereas that was true only for a minority of the people who expect to transfer within family. And then in the row below, below that, um, people who expect to transfer out of family are more interested in transferring to a beginning farmer or rancher. Um, look at that, 97% of them. And next slide, please. Um, this slide has gotten cut off, but what I want to show you is land owned. Um, using people, owners of less than 80 acres as a reference, people who own between 80 and 320 acres are marginally less likely to expect to transfer out of family. And people who own between 321 and 1,000 acres are um, less likely to transfer out, to expect to transfer out of family. Whereas people who own more than a thousand acres showed no statistical pattern. Um, next slide. And I'm gonna skip these box plots for time. So let's go on to the next one. So the big take homes from our multiple regression analysis um, was that owners who might transfer out of family, they need to finance retirement from the sale of the land. They are more interested in transferring to a beginner. They probably own less than 81 acres, but, that, but that's something worth exploring. Um, and 
uh, um, they're more likely to earn, to hold a four-year degree and they're more, more likely to be women. Next, please. Okay, so some takeaways for research into the landowner perspective on land access and in farm transfer and potentially useful to service providers and policy outreach is this blend we see of people needing to earn money from sale of the land to finance their retirement and at the same time having an interest in transferring to a beginner. And so how do they align those two values that they have and needs that they have? Um, so this agrees with other research that emphasizes how much support landowners need with succession and transfer planning. Ideally, that support comes from a team and ideally that team is networked with one another. So we have found and others have found that um, really priority audiences for learning about how landowners can align their financial needs with transferring to a beginner uh, include lenders, tax preparers, accountants, and other financial planners and attorneys. Um, next slide, please. Some really straightforward filters that policies and service providers could experiment with in terms of um, outreach to landowners who are likely to have assets to transfer out of family is you could filter by how much land they own. Um, you could reach out to women landowners. And if you have it, you could look at their educational attainment. Um, last slide. Um, so let's see. And it was very striking that all of the owners have an interest in transferring to a beginner and, and um, especially those who expect to transfer out of family. So this is a really rich area that research can really delve into is looking at how um, to support landowners in achieving a financially secure and meaningful legacy. Um, this is a great quote that the Nebraska Beginning Farmer Tax Credit Program collected from one of their landowner participants, the one on the top. And the landowner is saying, for us, it's important to give a beginning farmer a chance and not just make a big farmer bigger. It's really a joy to help someone get started. And then the bottom quote is one that we're, we gathered in our qualitative research um, from a Nebraska service provider reflecting on how active their state's beginning farmer tax credit program and their state CRP tip are. And this person was saying, look, it's a great incentive because there's a big chunk of money involved depending on the size of the agreement. Two, it really sends a message to landowners that this is something that the state encourages. Three, it sends, sends a message to beginners that they are valued by the state and encouraged to get into farming. The publicity end of that is at least as important as the cash that changes hands. So this need to support landowners in their financial priorities and their legacy priorities is again demonstrated by this exploratory research. So thanks so much. I just want to tell you that on our project's website, we have a lot of nice one page summaries of our findings. And then if you feel like reading an academic paper and you have some coffee, our academic papers are all free and open access, and they're good reading. Um, so that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Very good. And of course, it relates to much of what the Beginning Farmer Center is doing in, in Iowa. So it, it really aligns very well with us. I think I'm going to skip by some of the questions because many of them will relate to most all of our speakers. And we'll go right into uh, management and ownership transfer in small and medium family farms done by the Purdue, uh, let's see, Mar Maria Marshall from Purdue University and Renee Wyatt from Purdue Institute for Family Business. Thanks. Um, you can hear me? Okay, good. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, management and ownership transfer in small and medium-sized family farms um, and comparing them a little bit with other uh, non-farm family businesses. But basically this was a family, uh, small and medium-sized uh, farm family research project done in the Midwest. Um, and of course, you've already heard what a lot of, from the last two presentations, a big chunk of the motivation why this is such an important topic. 
Um, and so um, just to kind of give context as well is that less than 30% of family businesses last in the, into the second generation and only 10% last into the third. And these are family businesses in general. We know that we have centennial uh, farm family businesses and, and family farm family businesses tend to last longer. And a lot of times it's because we're looking at land transfer as we've, we've heard a lot about in the other two sessions. And, um, and so we have to think about is transferring the farm business just the transfer of land or is it the transfer of a viable business that goes from one generation to the next? And those are two different, can be two different things. Um, and so thinking about that, uh, that transfer and, how, and what are we talking about when we're talking about succession and transfer? Um, over 90% of US family business owners do want to pass their businesses on to the next generation. That's kind of the social emotional wealth that makes a family business a family business, that wanting to transfer to the next generation. And of course, we know that succession is complicated by all of the things we've heard uh, beyond just farm uh, land access, but family dynamics, uh, equity, fairness, all of those things that happen. Um, in terms of family business succession, and that a lot of family businesses are ill prepared. At the uh, Institute for Family Business, we deal with a lot of family business that want to transfer, and unfortunately, they it's when they want to start that succession process, they want to start it right now, and they probably should have started it five years ago, <laughs> right? And so they're coming and thinking it's kind of a a, a very short term process, and it actually can be quite a long term process to start that and and to get it into a viable way where all parties. Uh, feel like they they got the best out of the process because it is is a process um, and a lot of times we've got incorrect uh, planning so you've got uh, incorrect planning process in terms of first they go to a lawyer and a tax accountant to tell them what kind of things they need to do and the argument happens at the law office or the banker's office or or somewhere else instead of thinking about what are the goals and what do they envision as a long-term prospect for that family farm for that family business and then going on and saying this is what kind of we envision and this is what we want to set up so kind of starting at the opposite end so when we think about the succession process, there's three main components, and we're going to focus, um, this research focuses on two of those. So the three main components are management transfer, ownership transfer, and then estate. And a lot of people like to focus on the estate plan because that's, um, you know, they can write that down with their lawyer fairly easily. In a lot of these cases, they say, you know, this is what I want to happen when I die. Um, but the management and ownership is really giving up some of that power. It's a lot of communication and working with other generations. And so we focused on those and wanted to model those together because management and ownership transfer can progress um, asynchronously or they can progress concurrently. And um, like I said before, estate transfers upon death, but we wanna really focus on modeling management and ownership as these interrelated processes. Next slide, please. So management and ownership transfer, they're different, but they have similar qualities. So when we're talking about management, we're talking about the day-to-day -day operation of that farmer family business. We're talking about leadership and what they do. Um, when we think about succession in the management part, we really wanted the owners to take time to groom their successors, take that time to guide them through the process. Um, we want the owners to kind of go from that CEO role to slowly you know, waning out of the business to where they really become a consultant for that successor. And that successor starts kind of at the bottom and then they kind of move towards that CEO role. When we're looking at ownership, we're thinking about the financial property, the possessions, um, you know, tax and wealth considerations come into play here, retirement considerations, and timing is a really, really a key factor in the ownership transfer of the business. And some past research found that um, transfer can be really costly. So it can be about 160 hours and over $33,000 to plan. So some other considerations is when we're looking at management succession, we're looking at trying to clarify roles and responsibilities, thinking about family dynamics and really handing over that day-to-day -day operations. When we're thinking about ownership succession, we're thinking about valuing the firm, financing the transfer, and the legal and tax strategy of those implications. As you can see, those are these are very intermingled processes, but they are they do have some different emphasis to what we would consider a whole succession transfer process. 
And so uh, part of our research is we asked our participants in the Midwest uh, for, for these farm families, uh, where, they, where were they in this kind of management and ownership transfer process? And a lot of times we just see succession transfer, but we asked them that in each process, where were they? And not unexpected, a lot hadn't started yet. Um, we see that a lot. I teach a family business class, which is all farm kids, and I ask them, and they're also in that bucket, even though they've kind of had some talks, but they haven't really started anything official yet, or kind of unofficial. There's kind of some, you know, Thanksgiving talk, I would say, about what's going to happen. Um, and then you see we've got 34% that started the management transfer and 26% that started the um, ownership transfer. And then it goes on to having written the plan, started implementing. And what we see pretty much is that you'll see more people start a kind of a management transfer process before they start the ownership transfer process. So first you start seeing the transfer of responsibilities and management, some decision making, and then you start seeing this ownership transfer. And what um, was interesting to us and what made us want to go do this project is that um, where resentment and family dynamics really start into play is that you have a lot of management transfer and not a lot of ownership transfer and you've got a 55 year old farmer who's got a lot of management responsibilities but owns about zero to 10 percent of the farm. And so you start seeing these dynamics happen of like, how are you going to value the farm now after I spent 20 years working on it, but I have very little ownership. Um, and so that's what made that was one of the motivations for doing this project as again. Next, next slide. So when we were thinking about the methods of how we could um, how we could model management and ownership transfer together, but also separately, um, we looked at the seemingly unrelated bivariate ordered probit regression. And I'm going to go through the dependent variables real fast. Um, so like I said, we had management transfer and then we had ownership transfer. And for each of, the, each of those, like Maria discussed in the graph, um, they had a scale. So it, it took on the value of one if they hadn't started. It took on two if they had just started or if they have like an oral discussion, oral plan. And three, if they have basically taken any firm steps, have a written plan, started implementing or have finished transferring that process. Next slide, please. And so some of the business characteristics that we asked were, had they identified a successor, we just have shown that a lot, don't, don't. Um, whether they had discussed business goals frequently, um, whether their profit was over 50,000, you had a lot of businesses um, that were not very high profit businesses, business age, the founding, whether, whether they were the founding generation, uh, their business, legal business structure, whether they had, uh, common goals or that hindered them in their in their transfer process, whether they thought their business was successful um, and whether they had enough capital present to transfer the business. Next slide. So looking at family characteristics, um, we wanted to see how many family members were in the daily management of that business. Um, the number of family owners, so number of family members who own a part of that, that business. And then we have two um, binary response variables, which is the owner will give the business to the family. So if that owner has the intention to give that business to family, or if the owner would sell the business to an outsider. Um, and then we had this family business um, functionality scale, which is just a Likert scale from zero to 16, where zero is very dysfunctional and 16 is the most functional. We actually have an FB brag um, analysis tool that you can use as well with that. And you'd be surprised how many people tell you that they are dysfunctional or slightly dysfunctional or moderately functional, depending on how you, you would want to look at that. Some owner characteristics that we asked as well, of course, were um, if the owner invests in the business before personal finances, before their personal finances, whether they want the heirs in the business, um, and then uh, whether the owners want to start the, have st know how to start the transfer process. And it goes back to what Julia has said as well about knowing what the process will be and understanding what the startup process is. Whether the own, that primary owner was a woman, um, and then of course age, education, um, and, and then something else we've asked is whether this was a copreneur couple. So basically whether this was a spousal team that's working day to day in the business together. So looking at some descriptive statistics before we dive into the analysis, um, only 29% of family businesses had identified a successor, which basically aligns with past research when you look at only a third pass from the first generation to the second that lines up. 
Um, goal discussion happened um, on a quarterly basis or more frequently in 62% of businesses. Um, about 72% of owners in the study were founders. We want to mention this because when we have an owner who is a founder, it really tightens those emotional bonds to the business and it makes it harder to pass that business on or start passing that on. Um, when we look at mean owner age, it's about 55 years old. Um, if we're talking about mainly farm sample, it makes sense. Um, a lot of farmers farm for a long time before they retire. Um, only 38% were structured in an LLC corporation or trust, which can make passing on a business um, interesting and kind of more complicated sometimes. Um, farms accounted for 68% of our businesses in this study. And as Maria mentioned, copreneurs, they were about 68%. So 68% of our businesses worked with their spouse in this business. Um, and just briefly, I just wanted to reiterate that we used a seemingly unrelated bivariate order probate regression, basically just to be able to model both of those systems together at the same time. Usually research has done one or the other and we wanna look at them simultaneously. Next slide. So when we look at our management transfer results, we can see that having a su successor identified progresses that business through the management transfer process, as does discussing business goals frequently. Um, if the owner wants their heirs in the business, that would of course progress them through the management transfer process. And if the owner knows how to start the transfer process. Um, things hindering the management side would be if that business is a farm. So we don't, we, these farmers aren't wanting to pass on the management responsibilities. Um, lack of common goals. So if they don't, if the owner and their successor don't really align with common goals, or if the family business doesn't align in common goals, that can hinder the transfer process and management. And if the owner invests in the business before personal finances, that also, you know, slows the management transfer process. Next slide, please. I kept, oh, there you go, click through it. <laughs> and then, uh, so some of the uh, things that increase the ability or the likelihood of somebody uh, doing some ownership transfer was again, if the successor was identified. So really knowing and thinking about who you wanna pass on the farm really kind of starts you on that process, both on the ownership and management transfer. Uh, discussion, discussing goals frequently, and of course, the older the business, the more likely they were. To, to do that, as well as being a corporation interest versus a sole proprietor, whether there were uh, more family owners um, and uh, whether the business you wanted to give the business to, to a family member. And of course, the higher the functioning of the family, the more likely they were to have ownership transfer that kind of makes sense. Um, some things hindering uh, were and when you compare farms to other family businesses, these were food type businesses, uh, farms were less likely to pass ownership transfer and that would, would make sense since farmers usually do management and then ownership and in a family business that's non-farm, you would probably have both at the same time. And if you had a spousal team working together on the farm, they were also less likely to pass on um, and start on that process of ownership transfer. And you could say there would be probably more assets and more tied to um, that farm family business and a family business than, than if they were not uh, two, two spouses working together in the farm. So statistically speaking, after we ran this regression, um, ownership and management should be modeled separately but concurrently. So they should be modeled together. Um, but as separate processes. Um, we had, as you could see, um, family, business, and ownership characteristics um, affected both management and ownership transfer. And a big takeaway for us was farms really progress slower than non-farm businesses when we're talking about management and ownership transfer. But you know, a lot of that goes back to the retirement age of farmers, how farms are very asset heavy. It makes it harder to pass that property when you have a lot of money involved versus if you had like a printing shop with a smaller, with a smaller um, amount of property. So those were two big conclusions that we wanted to take away. So further is, um, this is a kind of a framework that some family business researchers have put together. And I think um, from the outreach side, we see that you really need this strong foundation of goal discussion, identifying a successor or successors, right? It doesn't have to be one, whether it's family or out of the family, because that really kind of starts the process going or that thinking process. 
um, and really educating the owner on how to start this process. And what we see in extension particularly is that people want to come directly. If you have a program and you talk about structuring taxes and legal setup, you get tons of people. If you get people about, hey, let's talk about family dynamics and you know figuring out your goals, you get two people, right? So <laughs> thinking about how somebody really needs to think that clarifying those goals really sets you up to doing everything else. And that's kind of the, the good solid foundation that you need to kind of start that process. And maybe we need to trick people into one thing and start with another, but that really um, is what, what we kind of need to think about. Um, and, you know, sometimes we, we reiterate this by telling them that, yeah, we've got a lot of farm families that have passed on the farm, but according to our research, 44% of them said that, yeah, they completed the process, but they didn't, didn't deem it as successful. So they got the family farm, but they're not, they're not talking to their cousins or their brothers, or they didn't think the process was fair or transparent. And so really getting those foundation really gets you to having a happy and a transparent succession process where you're getting the farm and you're still talking to your relatives. So for practitioners who are advising farm family businesses, these could be um, extension educators, consultants, you know, if they come in contact with these family businesses, we really want to reiterate that we want those family businesses to build a strong foundation, clarify those goals and priorities, and have some family governance structures in place. And that can really help in their succession, both on the management side and the ownership side. And so um, if you want to contact us or want any further information, whether it's using the FB BRAG, where we would call it the family functioning scale, which is just four questions, or any other resource related to the succession process, um, we have a lot of resources in the Purdue Institute for Family Business related to um, everything from a question of the month to uh, real uh, estate planning and financial planning to maintaining family bonds. So looking at this family succession process and the family business is a holistic way. Thank you so much, Renee and Maria. Good job. I especially like the comment about family businesses need to focus on communication. Uh, I look at that as being the number one issue in so many situations. So thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda, we have uh, some folks from the University of Illinois. We have Gary Snitke and Krista Swanson talking about expansion strategies for beginning farmers in the Corn Belt, less reliant on rented farmland. So Gary. Good, good, good morning. And uh, uh, I am Gary Schnicki and Krista Swanson is here as well. And we are both researchers at the University of Illinois who work very closely with farm management. We can go to the next slide. What we are t thinking about today is expansion strategy for beginning farmers. And we'll define that rather loosely in the Corn Belt that are less reliant on rented farmland. And if we can go to the next slide and we will see what is a what we would think of or may, many think of as a traditional model for for getting going in farmland in the Midwest on a corn field. You start out with the rented farmland base. And as you go through time and build up resources, you acquire more rented and owned land as the financial resources allow. And finally, at the end of your career, you own a significant amount of farmland. So that would be what many people would say is the traditional model. And here are the problems that we see with, with that. And I, we just listed three, and there are others, but with that model. And we'll, we'll illustrate all of these a bit. Farmland is becoming increasingly capitalized. Um, so it's harder to buy farmland off the old renting, off the returns from land, farmland. Rented farmland has very narrow margins, particularly in the Corn Belt. And if you're thinking about other farming commodity oriented uh, activities such as livestock, you need to be really large scale to make those work, to get those efficiencies. So you have one, uh, one enterprise competing with the other in terms of getting to, the, to, to efficient size. Here's our result is that you have to begin to look at off farm sources and farmers have been doing this for a long time, but it's pro we probably be, need to be more cognizant of this and build it more into our educational programs in, and into our thinking. We'll go through what the problems are and, and the macroeconomic environment has seen interest rates decline since the 1980s. And that has resulted in all assets having their, their, 
values are much have become much more capitalized relative to the value that they produced. Farmland is particularly hit hard by that phenomena because it is an infinitely live asset. In 2020, we hit very low levels. If you look at what the cash rent is compared to land value, it's very low at a very low level. Now, while we can finance that farmland at low, low, low interest rates, we still have this multiple problem that is, is that farmland itself is a much higher multiple of earnings today than it was 10, 20 years ago. So that that's that is going to be a problem with owning farmland or getting that farmland owned until we see something happen on the interest rate side. If we look at the cash rented side of farmland and the returns there on our next slide, what we've seen is, is that returns to farmland are, and, and this shows returns to rent, rent farmland have gone down in recent years. 2013 being a break, and now we're seeing that farmland in central Illinois, heart of the Corn Belt, is generating about $25 per acre. That's after paying all financial cost and rent. And $25 compared to say a $10,000 value or even the 300 or so dollars that you need in other, 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 other assets to rent a farmland doesn't go very far. Again, we're seeing those rented farmland values being lower today than they were 10 years ago and even 20 years ago. And it's also important to point out that these are nominal values. If you begin to look at that in terms of, uh, in terms of real values, they're going down more than what is being shown on this slide. Off farm income, and you see those, the, this slide that shows it from our FBFM has always been an important source of revenue, but it's growing. And you can see our less than 40 years old in this slide in 2019, it's something over $30,000 of off-farm wages. We haven't uh, quantified this on, on, this is just wages off-farm. We haven't looked at that or broken that down by other farm enterprises or uh, farm non-farm enterprises that are far, part of the farm business. But all of those are important as we begin to thinking about growing that farm enterprise. So, it's likely that this will grow in importance in the future. I mean, just think about the trends, think about health insurance and need to get health insurance off the farm. So all of those things would suggest that trends in off farm activities are going to be very, more important, not less important in the future. And now we're gonna to turn to some of those or dividing some of those out and Krista's gonna take that away from here. Right. As Gary just said, my name is Krista Swanson, and I work closely with him um, in the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics at the University of Illinois. But in addition to that, uh, I'm also a young beginning farmer. Uh, I farm with my husband in Illinois uh, on a grain farm. So uh, I am in this position that we're talking about uh, personally, where we are young farmers and trying to you know, figure out how to become established and, and grow and realizing how difficult that is to do uh, if you rely only on the, the income generated um, from, from farmland and, and particularly rented farmland as Gary shared some of those numbers earlier uh, because often that is the way that, uh, you know, a young farmer gets started. So uh, we have divided types of um, off-farm income sources into three categories. And the first of those is off-farm employment. And I'll say that I feel like a lot of, um, I'm gonna provide some examples of each. And of course, the examples that I provide are not all inclusive to every potential opportunity that could fall underneath that group. But to start with off-farm employment. So, this is one way to bring in extra um, income. And of course, uh, full -time, a full-time position would likely come with not just the income side, but also a value of health, and, uh, health benefits. And any self-employed person knows um, you know, how costly and challenging those can be to come by. Uh, health insurance can be if you 
don't have that provided with the job. Um, now, a challenge to full-time employment is, you know, that may work for a young individual who's getting started in farming and isn't farming a whole lot initially, but if the goal is to grow uh, your farm, then at some point, it may be really difficult to maintain full-time employment. Um, and part-time jobs often can still add income, but wouldn't likely come with those health benefits. Uh, a farming couple may have an advantage in this respect because one, one individual may be able to be on the farm full-time while another is able to work off the farm and still you know, contribute to that joint uh, income and growth in the business. Uh, there are part-time options that may be available to people who need to offset the busy season on the grain farm. Uh, I know of some farmers that work as accountants and uh, you know, in the Midwest, our busy seasons are the spring and the fall, and an accountant has a busy season in the winter. Um, my dad was a road commissioner, a township road commissioner, when I was growing up. And again, the busy times are the off seasons of the grain farm. Um, and then, um, okay, sorry, I'm getting a message that my audio is very choppy. I don't know what to do about that. Um, That's better. Okay, did I, is it a little better if I scoot a little closer? Can, okay, I, um, and then I just wanted to say the opportunities in rural areas, the one challenge to this um, can be that there isn't always a whole lot of opportunities for employment in rural areas. Um, one benefit of COVID in the season that we've been in so far in 2020 is that more um, companies and organizations are looking to hire people and willing to allow for remote uh, work situations. And so um, farmers may have more opportunities um, uh, for work uh, off the farm, even from a rural location. And so the next slide, please. Um, Farm-related enterprises is another category. And so in this category, we are talking about using the resources in a new way. So farmers may have resources like farmland or buildings or machinery. And this is thinking about ways to use those um, outside of the traditional. While you're building your maybe more commercial grain farm, um, how can you use the resources that you have at, to generate income in a new way? Um, so making investments, uh, this may involve making investments, um, custom farming, uh, so maybe using machinery that you are purchasing for your small amount of acres, um, doing some custom work for someone else would allow for that cost to be spread over more acres. Or um, there's also opportunities to do custom um, feeding for livestock. Uh, so these are ways that uh, maybe to generate other income while using resources on your farm. Um, agricultural sales of farm products or farm services is another avenue. Um, often these can be commission-based positions that allow someone to work on the farm and have a flexible schedule while earning an additional income. And then alternative farm products and alternative marketing channels. So um, for instance, maybe again, using those resources you have to uh, you know, start an agritourism venture with an orchard or a pumpkin patch, thinking about uh, maybe you can have some cattle, a small amount of cattle and sell the meat to a local restaurant who's wanting um, local products. Uh, there are a lot of ways to get really creative to use the resources on your farm uh, to, to provide a different line of income than the traditional um, in order to help you to establish help young farmers to get established. And next slide. Um, Off-farm enterprises. So anyone who is a young farmer likely has a lot of strong entrepreneurial um, abilities. And so you, uh, young farmers can use those entrepreneurial uh, inclinations to turn other skills or strengths or talents that they have into a business. Um, and so this does not need to be agriculture related. And and sometimes having a separate business that isn't agriculture related can actually be really valuable because um, it may not follow the same cycles that the agricultural industry follows. So maybe you're really good at um, 
working with computers and you could have a side business doing that and you can kind of choose when to take on more business based on you know when you're busy or more or less busy on the farm um anyway there are a lot of ways to really think about how to utilize like i said those skills strengths and talents that you already have um, to generate income um, and, and put your entrepreneurial inclinations to work next slide please and so to summarize, um, like Gary started, uh, this, is, this is something that has always been difficult. Some of the, the presenters in, earlier in our session have talked more about um, you know, the policy surrounding getting started. And our focus is more on, okay, the young and beginning farmers that are already there and they're getting started and how to deal with um, meeting the income needs that you need to to continue to grow um, and, and become a more financially stable farm or invest in purchasing, making those farmland purchases. Um, and, and that has always been challenging, but the current economics make it a little bit more challenging um, with some changes that we've seen in, in land costs and interest rates and just being able to, you know, the, the net difference um, on rented farmland, which is often how people, young farmers get started. Um, and then, so we, we see this increasing need to rely on off-farm employment, farm-related enterprises or non-farm enterprises as supplemental sources of income. And so um, I guess our, what we would like to see is ways to build educational programs to help farmers to, um, be able to to do these things to figure out what those strengths are how they can utilize their resources what opportunities there are out there and uh, really to help them uh, to figure out what's the best way to help to grow their farm into the future so um, thank you for your time today and uh, we look forward to talking more in the question session uh, at the end of our session thank you so much krista and gary Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to hurry along to our last uh, set of presenters from Auburn University. Uh, what drives beginning farmers entry and exit? A county level analysis uh, by Valentina Hartuska, Dennis Nadolniak, and Nisha Sharwat. Okay, good morning. Do you hear me? Okay. I was um, worried that I won't be heard very well. So we will, uh, this last uh, paper, I think kind of nicely summarized a lot of the discussions that we have had uh, in uh, this session and in other sessions in terms of how that transition results into beginning farmers growth uh, in the sector essentially. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a nice uh, slide from the National Agricultural Statistical Service showing where beginning farmers are on county level and describing essentially uh, the basis for our data set. We see that beginning farmers are much larger proportion these days compared to previous census years uh, of 27% overall, and they're playing increasingly important role. There are substantial numbers and it's important to understand uh, what uh, uh, drives their net entry. Next slide, please. So we already observed a lot of the papers devoted and some uh, showing some of the um, summaries that I have here. We saw that beginning farmers today are larger share than uh, those before in previous years. And they're different from previous cohorts. For example, they own more land, fewer are full-time full -time farmers as the previous speaker just emphasized the need to do, to have off-farm employment. Uh, the survival rate is a uh, very, not very as high as it could be. Actually, we saw yesterday some very interesting numbers showing um, uh, up to 50% survival rate, but uh, some of the published research shows less. And of course, most importantly, beginning farmers today operate in period of ongoing transition of farm assets. As the introductory speech showed that a lot of the farmers, um, the, in the next 10 years, about 70% of the land will be transferred. So where will that land go? And what can we learn from uh, what we know so far. We also heard about all of the challenges the beginning farmers are facing, and I want to highlight only two, uh, which are shown in our results as well. The scale of operation, of course, is very difficult to start if you're small and don't have the capital, and in that sense, access to credit and the use of credit is very important, 
and um, there's a lot of uh, room for improvement here, for example, because credit remains uh, collateral driven uh, rather than um, business plan driven. And many of the programs, lastly, that have been tried to help beginning farmers have been successful, but they can be uh, improved upon. Next slide, please. So what we know about uh, beginning farmers uh, exit and growth previ from previous work is that uh, they see using individual census data, it seems that uh, we found the two different related studies, one on BFRs and one on retiring farmers, that it seems that the flow of variables like income, return on assets, or off-farm off -farm work are not necessarily affecting the uh, exit of BFRs, which tells us that there's a certain level of resilience and perhaps commitment to farming as a lifestyle. Uh, in addition, we know from previous study on net exit and entry that larger farms are less likely to exit. There is a link, positive link to government payment and survival of larger farms. And uh, that all farm work, uh, interestingly, uh, for previous period, which is just before we start, uh, all farm work accelerated actually exit in net loss counties. And we use, I underline this article because we use a lot of the concepts. Uh, this is an AJE article that we follow in our analysis. Next slide, please. So what our research question is, what are the factors that affect net entry of beginning farmers and ranchers? And our hypothesis is that net entry is affected by barriers of ent to entry, economic factors and incentives, credit, labor costs, demographic factors, as well as weather and climate. The period of our study is 20 years, starting from 97 to 2017, and we assembled the county level data sets from a variety of sources that captured variety of factors. Again, most of them were identified already as important uh, by the BF, uh, beginning farmers and ranchers community. Next slide I can skip and I can go straight to the results. Uh, so, well, let's go back to the slides. I just want to show. So we estimate essentially a fixed effects models, method, uh, model, models several clustered on county level where the entry or exit, net entry we call it into farming, is measured as the log difference uh, between, um, uh, between farmers in period T and T, T minus one, and as a function of barriers to entry, economic environment incentives and other controls. Next slide, please. Our dependent variables, uh, net entry is measured again by the log difference between operators at T uh, and um, operators T minus one. Net entry, we observed it on 10 year census interval because BFRs are those defined by 10 years or less of experience. The intervals are three. Uh, and um, estimated coefficients are easy to interpret in that way because they're semi-elasticities that they show the percentage change in entry ratio per unit change in the explanatory variable. Uh, exit cannot be observed uh, for BFRs or established farmers, but we can infer what's going on and we infer the dynamics by looking at the separate coefficients for beginning farmers change and uh, or, or, uh, those that are all farmers or over 65. So let's go to the next slide, please. More specifically, the three dependent variables and samples, uh, we have net entry as BFRs, all principal operator net growth, which is the BFR net entry plus BFR from previous 10 year interval that survived or became established minus the exit of established. And then we also study what happens in all uh, principal operator age, age 65 and older. These are the established farmers from previous 10 year interval that became 65 minus all the farmers that retired. So again, the relative magnitude in the coefficients of these different samples are going to tell us a lot about uh, uh, the impact or not the impact because we don't infer causality here, but the association between various factors and the growth of beginning farmers, which is a policy objective, uh, uh, attracting more people to the profession and uh, keeping them in. So next slide, please. A final thing that we do following the AJ article is we separate uh, the, to uh, create two additional samples of counties that gained farmers during the 10 interval period, net gain, and counties that lost farmers during 10 years. And we look at the differences in those. We can skip that slide, we go straight to the results because I'm concerned about time. So essentially, uh, you, you see here each column represents the first three columns are all counties. The last two are counties that gained farmers and counties that lost farmers. And for, for these last two, we estimate the net entry of beginning farmers. Um, the, the explanatory variables are actually uh, based on um, 
there is an American Economic Review article from 2004 that defines at least 10, uh, provides at least 10 definitions of barriers to entry. What is a barrier to entry? It usually has to do with the incumbent um, and the new entrant and what are the cost of the incumbent relative to the cost of the new entrant, or they can be the cost of entry overall. So the, the one of the key points of this um, article, of course, is the competition is important and can represent barrier to entry. And also the scale of operation is very important, which in agricultural economics we know is extremely important and shows clearly in the results. So this is the barriers to entry uh, idea comes from there and access to credit is also uh, important. So let's look at some of the results and see how BFR net entry differs from uh, that uh, other groups and uh, what we can learn from that. The first and important thing that the results uh, show consistent with everything we've heard so far is that uh, the scale of operation is important. And if you look at the variable of value of ag output in the county, it's negatively associated with growth in beginning farmers. And uh, the coefficient is several times bigger than that, uh, twice, uh, at least twice bigger than that in all operators and those that uh, above 65. So I'm, I'm reading the results across uh, and interpreting them. So similarly, the cropland, that's a very interesting result. Uh, counties with higher uh, cropland uh, levels of, uh, uh, with higher cropland are less likely to experience growth of new farmers, and, but they're more likely to experience growth of existing farmers, which is a very interesting result, confirming the fact that we heard several times that we have uh, um, uh, beginning farmers suffer from lack of scale, so they need to achieve certain scale in order to be uh, able uh, to, to maintain and sustain their operations. And you will see the next variable is that we control for the beginning farmers at the beginning of the period and uh, all the operators at the beginning of the period. And we can see clearly that beginning farmers at the beginning of, a, of the period uh, are negatively correlated with the growth rate of beginning farmers, which is what you would expect. So competition within the beginning farmers affects ability of that group to grow. And uh, it's the opposite effect of uh, uh, all the operators. But what I noticed, what we notice here is that the coefficients of all the operators are very small. So all the challenges that were expressed today and yesterday on the difficulty of transferring, uh, transferring land and transferring assets to beginning farmers, it seems to, uh, to be reflected by this uh, very small but positive coefficient. And then interestingly, we find that the value of our land and buildings is positively in a county is positively associated with the growth of beginning farmers and three times bigger than that of other operators, uh, which means that the capital in agriculture is important and, and uh, that farmers are going towards uh, activities that um, uh, have potential uh, to, 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 to grow. Uh, Interestingly, access to credit itself, and that's one of the main conclusions, I believe, is not important. So we looked at a lot of uh, providers of, uh, of uh, loans, for example, banks, farm credit system, and tried to map them within each uh, county, and we found no effect of the access to physical facilities. That is not to mean that credit is not important, we'll see on the next slide. But in terms of per square mile banks, we also tried per 100,000 uh, 100, per thousand per, per scale by population, it never seemed to be a, uh, associated with BFR net entry. In terms of economic environment and incentives, it seems that beginning farmers are entering in more ag dependent counties, two times higher uh, coefficients relative to that of other uh, farmers, including those that are also, ag uh, they, they tend to go into uh, areas that is, uh, that are more agricultural and produce higher proportion of ag, uh, output relative to non-ag output. But that's very interesting because we know from the literature that a lot of beginning farmers go into, uh, into niche uh, enterprises and they probably go into metro. We don't observe that uh, the standard variables like unemployment, like land price per acre, metro area affecting that growth of beginning farmers. But when we look at the counties that gained farmers, what we observe is that there, counties that gain uh, uh, farmers, so the growth in those counties is 
metro areas are associated with higher growth rates for beginning farmers. So there is, there is that fact there that beginning farmers are the ones going into metro area where farming is taking off as a, as a, as a activity. Ne uh, here again to confirm previous results is the next, uh, the next results on net farm income and working off farm. Clearly, we see that uh, beginning farmers' entry and growth is, um, is positively associated with uh, ability to work uh, uh, off-farm and with the availability of such off-farm uh, work. Uh, specifically here, uh, we see that these two variables are sig statistically significant in the first column, but the net far non-farm income is not significant for other operators because they derive most of their income from farming. And then, we see that uh, the coefficients, when they are significant, the ability to work off farm or numbers of uh, farmers who work off farm, the coefficient is much higher, which means for beginning farmers relative to established and others, it's much more important to have access to uh, off farm work. Very interesting results on government payments and uh, crop identity payments. As you will notice here, consistent with what we heard yesterday is that Counties with higher level of government payments are associated with higher growth of beginning farmers' entry. And also, similar impact is on the operators. Uh, but negative, uh, but uh, and, uh, however, this, the growth of those over 65, the magnitude is much higher, twice higher than that on beginning farmers, which means that these government payments are helping the growth of retiree retirement age farmers over 65 and when you look at the counties that gained them gain farmers extremely interesting the government payment has actually as associated with negative growth of beginning farmers so they are an obstacle to beginning farmers because from what we can see the relative magnitude of the coefficients they are seemingly driven by going uh, they're not going to beginning farmers but they're going to um, um, their competition in the face of established uh, and um, uh, retirement age farmers. Similarly, the crop indemnity payments uh, positively associated with, neg uh, with the net uh, BFR entry, but negative with the net entry uh, in counties that gained, um, uh, gained um, farmers overall. Now let's go to the next slide and just quickly talk about credit. Uh, we this is not a result from one single regression. Uh, the first one is separate regression from the rest uh, <laughs> controls, but I try to present them as succinctly as possible. So real estate farm debt does not seem to be associated with growth of beginning farmers, but non-real estate farm debt is, which is again and twice more sensitive than that in other farmers and uh, established farmers. So it's very uh, important to keep in mind that all the stuff that we heard yesterday in the credit sessions are completely valid. Now, in a, se in a separate regression where the, real, the debt is uh, uh, separated by real estate and non-real estate, uh, and uh, each category is included in a stepwise regression, what we observe immediately is the, some of the things that we again talked about. So if you look at it, uh, uh, the beginning farms and the BFR's net entry is more sensitive to storage facility loans, uh, into real estate debt, the life insurance companies, and negatively associated with individuals and other when we have, when we talk about real estate debt. This is very important to, to, to notice. The only negative coefficient here is, uh, association is with individual and others within the real estate debt. Again, it has to do with the fact that beginning farmers don't have real estate to pledge as collateral. And uh, the higher the proportion of that uh, loan, the, the less likely they are to be able to grow, to enter and uh, to enter. And uh, again, this is a barrier to enter in terms of volume of loan, not of access to facilities. And in terms of non-real estate debt, completely non-surprisingly, we see that the farm service agency, which of course lends to beginning farmers has a very high association loans by farm credit uh, service agency have very high association with the beginning farm net entry. Uh, individuals and others here are also positive and highly uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and significant and much twice the magnitude of uh, on other um, growth uh, rates. If we can go to the next slide real quick, I won't uh, spend too much Next slide. 
Okay, next slide. We also control for various labor inputs. Uh, no, no, one back, please. Just for for 30, 20 seconds. So the full time labor account is that uh, where the full time labor is necessary for the uh, for the service, for the activities in the ag center has negative association with the growth rate of beginning uh, farmers and uh, also. Uh, wages uh, uh, do not seem to matter at this point, but the, what is important is the beginning farmers seem to be entering in counties with higher level of, edu uh, of education, so negative impact on high school diploma or less. And finally, the climate data shows the beginning farmers are entering in warmer, uh, more likely to uh, the growth of begin beginning farmers net entry is associated with higher temperatures, which is was clearly shown on the map where you would see a lot of darker part in the south and uh, southeast area. Uh, and next final slide. To summarize what we found and to link it again to what we talked about today and yesterday, and we'll probably talk about credit later, is that BFR entry decreases with, with competition among BFRs themselves, the size of the ag output, scale economies issues, but increases with the size of the ag capital, more ag dependent counties and larger uh, value of our capital, all the PO, uh, per, um, principal operators and ability to work off farm, something that was consistently uh, cited here. Government payments and crop indemnity payments keep all the farmers in operation and reduce, net, reduce their net exit in counties with growing number of farmers and may need to be refocused to help more beginning farmers. Credit remain crucial, but it's not about the location of the facilities that distribute credit but it's about the volume and the type of loan specifically, FSA, storage facility loans, and loans from individuals and others are important with the loans from individuals and others have uh, uh, negative uh, um, impact, real estate loans, while the positive are associated with, uh, positive, uh, with individuals and others are positively associated with beginning farmers growth. And finally, BFR net entry is high in counties with warmer climate and better educated labor force. So what can we conclude from that is that stakeholders and policymakers could continue to su provide support uh, uh, for credit or support the availability of credit, and they should perhaps consider the trade-offs trade from supporting BFRs and retiring farmers, considering where the um, uh, government payments uh, go. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Valentina. Um, <clears throat> they've asked uh, that we jump into the uh, questions and answer period. Um, Nisha and da Dennis, if that's okay. Uh, one of the first questions that we received was for Holly, and it talks um, and asks, what is the public policy that you would like to see to accomplish the land transfer goals you have? And then also, when will the new report be available? And that would be for Holly. And most all of you would have your thoughts and comments. And if you feel impelled to do so, uh, maybe follow up with Holly's comments. Yeah, um, I was going to say that we heard lots of great um, policy suggestions and other presentations this morning. Um, to quickly answer the question about timing for the report, um, we're hopeful it'll be sometime in the next few weeks. Um, we don't we don't have a specific date um, at this exact moment. We're working on the um, on the website side of things and making sure that that's all ready to go. So it'll be coming soon. Um, and then on the policy front, uh, yeah, there's a there's a list of things in the report. And so I I want to say definitely um, check that out. And that kind of the the point I will make around that is that. We, you know, in the way that we structure the report, we're not really pointing to any one thing. And the reason I'm kind of avoiding that question now is just that it's a, a real, I think, ecosystem of policies that need to change. And um, there are lots of great examples out there. I, I don't, I don't want to take up all, a ton of time by just reading through the list right now, but I would encourage everyone okay. to read the report. <laughs> Thank you. And, and the next question that I would throw out to the whole group, uh, what strategies have you used to work with young farmers on their homelands, trying to strengthen local eco economics and newcomers to those areas. How how have you collaborated and diminished gentrification? 
negatively impacting efforts of traditional communities. I would open that up to the whole group if you have thoughts on what strategies you have used to work with young farmers on their homelands. I guess I would I would throw out the, my comment that uh, many times we, we provide uh, beginning farmer um, networks uh, for young people to work with each other seems to work well, as well as beginning farmer workshops. So that's one way the beginning farmer center has done that. Any other thoughts on that question? I, I guess I would just mention that uh, farmers are entrepreneurs and business people. So making sure that that business acumen is there. I mean, starting a business is always difficult and there's a lot of failures in any business. So realizing that fact and, you know, planning is crucial in, in, in any sort of business. And so continuing those the business planning efforts is, is very key. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Martha wanted me to mention that uh, she's opened up the question and answers in the uh, land access table in the lounge for, for later uh, sharing. Uh, this question would be for Julia. Do people selling, transferring to non-family members have family members that are farming? So is it a choice or lack of family members who are interested in owning farmland? It's the latter. It's what we observe is that it's owners who are likely to have children who are all happily occupied in other professions. Um, and so um, there's not a demand within the family to operate the land. Um, and so that's what leads someone to want to work with an unrelated successor. Um, you know, depending on their priorities for the future of the land. Um, what would you all say, Renee and Maria, that you observe in your research? It's been very similar. It's that there's, there's nobody in the family that wants to continue um, and they want it to continue informing. This was a comment in the question uh, box. Uh, Julia, the quote about joy coming from helping the next generation reminds me of what farmers with conservation easements say. Were any of the farms in the survey protected with a conservation easement? We, I think that is not something we asked in this instrument, partially because we had in a previous one and the impression that we got from service providers who work with a lot of landowners throughout the Midwest and the Plains is that that's a tool that's used much less in our region where the development pressures are generally lower than they are on the coasts where these tools started and are used more. So, so far at least, these tools have been used less where we are. And so I don't think we asked the owners in this survey whether they're doing anything with the conservation easement. And that's why. Okay. Although so lately I was, in a, I was in a talk by uh, the lead planner of Louisville, Kentucky, a, a, you know, an, a rural county just outside of Louisville, Kentucky, who was talking about how they're using tools right and left. So it, it's relevant here. It's just, we found it to be a little less relevant. And so didn't ask about it in the follow-up. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from Maria and Renee. Do you notice any key tipping point that gets a family to make key changes or decisions in ownership transfer? Um, so one of the things that we have seen, and I think this is not in the data, so I'll give you the anecdotal changes. Beyond data, yes. <laughs> Um, so one of the instruments or one of the things that we use with families, um, family businesses is this, um, is a roadmap where they have to map T plus whatever, how many years they think. 
And that gets them very quickly thinking about when ownership and management need to happen and at what stage. And we found that that was a key component of them thinking about when is it exactly that they're going to start transferring management and when are they going to start transferring ownership and then it doesn't have to be concurrent. It doesn't have to be at the same time, but when does it happen and how and thinking about if they're switch if they're providing ownership very far from when they're transferring management that there are equity concerns and valuing the firm concerns about how much the the value of the firm has gone up from the time that person started and how they're going to actually get into the business so we've found this kind of roadmap um instrument that we've been using with families to really get them to think about how that happens and what does that mean for the valuing of the firm and that second generation that successor and how they're going to buy into the business and think about uh, the business and what it's worth um, that that kind of gets them to think about okay yeah we need to start doing this and we need to have some pathway to get this done okay very good um, the other question we had from Maria and Renee and maybe Renee can address this why did you start with goals? rather than vision and mission? And how did you decide on that modeling strategy? And what alternatives did you consider? Okay, so um, we had goals in our survey. Um, Maria can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that we asked about if they had a vision or a mission in our survey. Um, we just, we started with goals because that is, um, was, that was in the data. Um, and what was the second question? Oh, how did we get to the, um, how we modeled that? So um, we tried them in two separate regressions. We wanted to do the ordered probit because it allows us to do this like stage type of thing because management transfer, it's not, it's not a binary response, right? It's not yes or, well, it can be yes or no, but we like to say, where are you now um, in this process and kind of model it that way. So that's why we wanted to do an ordered probit. And um, by by doing the unrelated, the bivariate ordered probit, we were able to model those at the same time because we think those processes do happen sometimes simultaneously. They're not always in sync. Um, we, like, we like to model those processes together because they are related. They do affect each other. And statistically, after we ran it, it did show that they do need to be modeled together. Okay. And they also ask about uh, wanting you to talk more about the functional dysfunctional measurement tool. And can we get access to that? Okay. Yep. So that is the, we call it the FB brag. It's the family business functioning scale. There's four simple questions. Um, you can scale it yourself at home. It's simple. It's simple math to scale your business. What we, um, we, you can find it on the Purdue Institute for Family Business website. Um, you can download it right there. It's also um, it's also published in the Journal of Extension under Tools of the Trade. You can find it there as well. Um, we like to have people take those to to their family members and have multiple people in the family complete those. And so you can kind of compare scores. And we kind of talk about that in the in the publication as well. Um, how if someone ranks the business as dysfunctional and someone else rates it as functional, you need to see why that disparity is there and talk about that and get there through communication. So yes, it All is right. openly available. If you can't find it, email one of us and we'll send it to you. Very good, thank you. Well, this would go out to all the speakers. It seems that discussions around farm transition can become negative fairly quickly when we talk to farmers and ranchers about their personal experiences. What gives you hope for the future on these issues? I suppose the negativity comes from talking about the death of, of the owner and the older generation and probably taxes, but go ahead speakers. If you've got a, a thought on that, uh, you know, what, what's giving you hope that uh, for the future, these can be addressed. If I can say my opinion real quick, I'm sorry. Uh, to, uh, working on these issues, it seems that beginning farmers are trying to produce better food than more food. So what gives me hope is that uh, uh, we are not quite able to capture uh, the enthusiasm that is there in some of these uh, new beginning farmers, but they have the potential to transform the whole field. So we look at traditional ways, measure income in traditional way, measure all these uh, 
other variables, but talking to people, they're really not into this to grow and to become big. They're there to fill in a niche, a lot of them, and just try to produce better food, uh, which is healthier and might have, uh, might be better in the long term, especially in some of the minority women farmers, etc. Okay, uh, jumping on uh, for Maria, is there a succession planning course for young farmers in Missouri as a college student hoping to come back to the farm, I am not sure where my family and I should start in the succession planning process. Is your course available? Um, well, we have a lot of resources on our institute site. My course is a, a live Purdue course, or it wasn't until I got a new center. <laughs> um, but I'm sure, I know that the, the Missouri Extension has resources for that. Um, you can email me and I will try to connect you to somebody at Missouri if they're not online now that, that teaches some, something that's similar in Missouri. But we have a lot of resources on our website that can take you through that process and you can always email us. And I would, I would be remiss if I didn't add that uh, Iowa State University has the Returning to the Farm Seminar. It's a four day workshop that we hold every January and February uh, for surrounding states as well as Iowa uh, Iowa farm family. So keep that in mind is something that you could check into on on my website as far as a four day course on doing just that. Even if you're from Missouri, we would definitely want to have you come up uh, to Ames for that course. Now, keep in mind with the uh, the COVID-19 issues this year, it does appear that we're going to have to postpone it and hold it later on, but we would definitely keep everybody informed. We often get uh, some families out of Illinois for that. So we definitely cross borders when it comes to training young people. Any other comments as far as training for young people that want to join the family farm? Well, I could back up a moment and just comment on the previous question about there's so much that's discouraging. Um, oh. <laughs> what gives you hope? Um, and I would say a couple things is one, um, gathering these stories of people who are managing to make a transfer that's secure and meaningful to the landowning family to a farm seeker. Because um, yeah, early on in our research, we heard people saying like, oh man, I only ever hear negative stories. And so then it was neat to begin to deliberately learn from people who are managing to make it work, You know, many of whom you work with, Dave. Um, and then another thing that's encouraging are these state uh, level policies that state legislatures around the country are increasingly passing um, in a bipartisan move. And so it's not like these policy incentives are perfect, but there's still a bipartisan achievement in this moment that's trying to transfer land and ranch and farm operations to a new, a new generation. So that's a really interesting and heartening trend in its own way. Okay, this question is for Gary and Krista. What is the main cause of the need for off-farm income? Is it just low commodity prices in recent years? Also, is this an issue worldwide? Uh, the low commodity prices made that issue worse, but you can make the argument that the high commodity prices that uh, existed from 2006 through uh, 2012 were an aberration. Honestly, um, I don't know if it's a worldwide phenomenon. My guess is it is a pro is an issue in the developed world. And it's one that at least goes back to when I was thinking about going back to the farm back in the late night or early 1980s. So this, this isn't new and it's always been tough, but I think it is a bit more, uh, have an issue today and um, Krista can, should give her yeah. some, We didn't really get into this today, but some other um, studies that we've done have also looked at, so I mean, you know, when we talk about income, we're looking at really the, the, the take home pay. Um, so we're looking at the margin between the, the gross income and the expenses. So, you know, when we talk about commodity prices as being a, a factor, it's, it's uh, when we're talking about grain farms. Um, but we've also, like I said, we've also done 
some other research looking at the expense side of things. So I think part of the problem also isn't just what are commodity prices doing, um, but what is that margin doing? And we've seen that expenses don't come down as quickly as they go up. So, um, you know, if you have this that period from 2006 to 2013 where incomes were strong and commodity prices were good, and then we have prices drop very quickly and expenses and cash rents and land values, um, those things are not coming down as quickly. And so then that, that margin is, is a lot lower. And so, um, you know, like I said earlier, as an actual farmer myself, I, I understand how that all works and the position that, that leaves farmers in. And I think that's really part of the, also part of the reason why we have this really, um, you know, this need for um, off farm income. Thank you. Valentina, this is a question for you. What is better food? Do we not produce high quality and healthy food right now? <laughs> <laughs> That's a well, um, that we definitely produce, produce high quality food, etc. But there are a lot of niche, niche areas in which uh, beginning farmers tend to come, especially in metro areas, the vertical agriculture, all these uh, um, areas where they're not going to be 100% of the US agriculture, but they're equally important in terms of uh, making differences in the lives of people who actually uh, don't have access typically to that type of food. So it's not a big, again, it's not the predominant. We do produce good food in a lot of food. We have access that we need to export. But a lot of people in the new generation, they're very motivated, they have different objectives, and they come from outside of agriculture background, which is very surprising. They're engineers, they're you know, people with different set of skills that bring innovation, which is not going to be you know, 90% of the, maybe it will become one day, but it's still very important. They, uh, you know, they, they start these unbelievable activities that make a difference in the lives of people like who live in food desert, etc. So these are small, small operations, and many of them don't even intend to become big. They just want to make a difference. For hobby farming as well. So that's what I was referring to because you were trying to look for a bright side. And to me, that is very potentially very exciting. I'm not yeah. negating the rest. I'm just saying that there is a nice new area that can expand and make huge difference. Thank you. Yes, we have three or four minutes left. If anyone has any final comments they'd like to make, I want to thank everyone for participating, even those in the audience, uh, for keeping transition and farm succession uh, in, in mind. And, and I want to thank them all for keeping that in the, in the front, uh, front scope, uh, knowing that all our speakers are on the front line working with these folks all the time. Um, if any of you have final comments on how we can keep that keep that going forward, uh, here's your chance. Well, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm hopeful as well. I get to work with a lot of young farmers around the country through our work at Young Farmers Coalition. And it's very hopeful to see young farmers getting organized and involved in policy advocacy. I think, you know, we've talked about a lot of the challenges and how they um, come down on the, on the farm. And I'm definitely familiar with that um, in my own family with farm transition. Um, but we have a lot of structural barriers that are going to need policy change. So I think it's very hopeful to see um, people getting uh, organized and advocating for that, to see that there's a collective awareness about the need to make land access more equitable and um, to advocate for policies that address that. And I think a growing, uh, yeah, just a growing awareness that we might be able to make some really big big picture changes that will have a lot of impact um, on the ground. And I didn't, you know, didn't mean to not at all answer the question earlier about what policies could change, because I certainly think there's there's a lot um, specifically related to just federal policy change in the farm bill that we're thinking about, but also these kind of local, at the local level, I think in, in zoning and in um, farmland conservation policy, farm protection, the tax credits, just to like throw out some categories there of, of where policy change can be really impactful. Um, so that's what, what makes me hopeful. I think I'm 
right now going to go back to our um, Young Farmers Convergence, which is another virtual conference that we're holding right now, which is a bunch of young farmers from around the country come together to share um, strategies and uh, leadership uh, skills. So uh, I'm very hopeful. Anyone else? I guess I would end by, again, thanking you for all of your research, all of your uh, you know, surveys. Uh, before we can make policy change, I, I think we have to have some type of background, some type of uh, answers for those that are making those policy changes. We have to be able to prove our point and, and bring it to the forefront. And this, uh, this conference, these last two days have definitely done that. I appreciate it. I'm sure we have a lot of uh, people in the audience uh, that are, are policy makers. And so they've listened, they've heard us speak and, and they can refer back to you guys for, for further clarification. So thanks again. Uh, I see it's 1130. So Jeff and Martha, uh, <clears throat> I guess we're going into our, our noon break. Thanks, David, and thanks to all our participants. I uh, really enjoyed the uh, presentations and the discussion that followed. Um, that's right, uh, David. We do have uh, a break for an hour, and I'd encourage people to go to the lounge uh, if you're able. Um, I had uh, some great conversations yesterday, and uh, that's where I plan to be. And then we're in one hour from now, we're going to come back. There's going to be a final session. It's shorter than the one we just did. It's an hour and 15 uh, minute session on farm credit. And, um, and then we'll wrap up. So hoping everybody can, can go to the lounge now and, and can come back um, at uh, 1230 Central, 130 Eastern.